Okay, so the last topic is TD Lambda, which is an extension of uh, TD Learning um, and uses eligibility traces. And eligibility traces uh, strongly improve the computational properties of multi-step reinforcement learning. Okay, um, so the idea is that um, we can average n-step returns over different ends. So we can, for example, take um, the the two-step return and average it with the four-step return into a composite return of both. And TD lambda is a particular way of averaging n-step returns um, in which each return is weighted by lambda to the power of n minus one and then it's normalized by uh, one minus lambda. So um, we basically take all the different uh, n-step returns and uh, weigh them by uh, using the, the lambda parameter and normalize this sum, this weighted sum of the composite return. And lambda is uh, between zero and one for this. Okay, how does this look like? So basically we have a weighting that decreases over time. So the most recent states are weighted more than um, states further in the past. And if we compare it here to this, um, this grid world example that I showed earlier, uh, between the 10 step SARSA and um, SARSA with um, lambda um, return, we see that now um, there's a decay over time, so uh, more recent states are weighed stronger than past states. Uh, Vivian, uh, just to uh, like interrupt you shortly, Georg wants to go back to the n step return again. Ah, okay. Um, uh, just, just have the definition on screen. It uh, would oh, be helpful, yeah, sure. at least for me. Um, because apparently there is some detail relevant for how this averaging works. Um, and uh, thanks. Yeah. Because there's also a discounted thing in the end step return. So I, um, uh, I was trying to make sure that I don't confuse the different discounting stuff. Yeah, right. So um, the gamma in the, in the, for the discounting um, of the, in this return, the gamma is discounting the value estimate. So how strong do you weigh um, close-term rewards as opposed to future uh, long-term rewards? And then um, the lambda factor is, uh, is weighing the GT uh, overall. So basically you take um, this whole thing and you add it up for different ends. So for example, um, for here N is two and N is four, and then you weigh both by 0.2 uh, by 0.5 and add them up. And in TD Lambda, you don't weigh them by 0.5, but you weigh them according to how how big N is. So how long is this uh, return over how many time steps? Okay, so Lambda is, uh, Gamma is for for the, the value estimates. So yeah, the, uh, discounting the rewards. And Lambda is how do I weigh the overall N step rewards for different uh, Ns? So, for example, here in in this case, these errors are weighted with lambda 0.9, and if you change it, it, it uh, either uh, remembers or updates more of the states further in the past, or less, or uh, stronger or weaker. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Okay, and we have this. Um, so yeah, st states that are further away in time are less eligible for updates when a reward is observed. Oh, this I shouldn't show. Um, so this is actually the next exercise. So we have um, this uh, lambda factor with which uh, weighs how these uh, different n-step returns are summed up. And um, lambda is uh, in the range of zero and one. And at uh, one of the extremes, uh, so if lambda is zero, it is um, one of, the, so at one of, either of the extremes is uh, either TD zero or Monte Carlo. And I was going to ask you if you can figure out which of the uh, extremes corresponds to which of the algorithms that we already talked about. So one is, um, all, of the, all of them are weighted with zero and the other one is uh, all of them are just added up together without any weighting or weighting of one. Um, and yeah, this is 
the exercise. So try to match TD0 and Monte Carlo to the two different um, lambdas. So the answer is, uh, if we have lambda at zero, this is like uh, TD0. And we have, if we have lambda at one, this is like Monte Carlo. Um, and if you got this right, give yourself a point. So because if we have lambda zero, we um, just take the, the one step return and uh, everything else is multiplied with zero and disappears. Um, and if uh, that's like TD zero, and if we have lambda one, we just sum up all the um, end step returns until termination, which is like Monte Carlo. Okay, which means that eligibility traces unify and generalize uh, TD and Monte Carlo methods. Okay, so there are two different views. The forward view, which is also called the lambda return algorithm, and the backward view, which is TD lambda. Um, and yeah, the forward view is more for theory and backward uh, view is uh, the actual mechanism and how it's mostly used. So in the forward view, uh, you can imagine it like looking forward into time to all future uh, rewards to determine the state update. So you are sitting on like a ray of states that go out until the terminating state and you just look ahead and see how much reward you, you, will, you will get. And the value update looks like this. So we add to the current value estimate um, the step size multiplied with um, the lambda return minus the value estimate of the current state. So basically the only difference is now that we use the lambda return here instead of the n-step return or the one-step return in TD0. And um, and get a color. Here, this is still the TD error. Okay. And the, the forward view, this value update can only be computed after the completion of an episode because we need to know all the future rewards. But uh, there is an equivalent view which can achieve the same effect without looking into the future. And that's the backward view. Um, and in the backward view, you can imagine it like uh, you're sitting on this uh, beam of states and you're shouting uh, the TD error backwards in time and the strength of your voice decreases over temporal distance. So the most recent states uh, hear it, the error the loudest and the ones that are further back in the past hear it uh, more quietly. And um, to do this, we uh, introduce a new vector called the eligibility trace Z, which goes along a weight vector. And the weight vector for this, we need to have a little short excursion to value function approximation. Um, this is a really uh, interesting topic and brings us to um, deep reinforcement learning. So let's just go there real quick and then Leon will talk about this a lot more. So um, in value function approximation, we try to approximate the value of a state using its features. So, so far we had the uh, value estimate or Q value estimates as a lookup table for each possible state or state action pair. And now we want to approximate this. And the reason for this is, Imagine you have a game like Breakout with an image size of 84 times 84. We use four consecutive images to decide on an action and we have uh, grayscale pixels uh, with 256 levels. That means we would have 256 to the power of 84 times 84 times 4 rows in the Q table, which would be 10 to the power of 69,970, which is a lot more than the number of atoms in the universe. So this is impossible to uh, store on any kind of machine. And even if it would be possible in a smaller example, it might even not be useful because almost every state that is encountered was never seen before if you have so many states. So it is just so unlikely that we end up in exactly the same state. So most of our Q values or V values are just uh, not learned random noise. So we, we need to generalize somehow. And to generalize, we can use function approximation to estimate um, V and Q. Uh, and the idea is to basically um, 
have a function with parameters w, which takes as an input either the state or state in action, and it outputs a value estimate for this. And those should approximate, of course, the actual value function or q-value function. Okay, and um, these weights or parameters w can be uh, features of different approximation methods. For example, it, they can be just linear features of uh, the state features, the linear function of the state features, can be a polynomial function, can be Fourier basis functions, radial basis functions, or uh, currently most prominent um, multilayer perceptrons uh, for deep reinforcement learning, often also convolutional neural networks. Um, and using those, we can then approximate the value function and generalize to new unseen states. And usually the dimensionality of uh, these parameters is a lot smaller than the number of possible states. Um, additionally, this also makes learning in partially observable environments possible. And just quickly, what does partially observable mean? So before we had um, this little grid world with this state and a reward, and we could see everything in this grid world. But we could also imagine that our agent has uh, eyes that can only look into one direction. So it can, for example, just see this. And then the observation would be looking like that, three fields with nothing. And then if the agent turns to the right, it would see this, and then its observation would look like that. But at one point in time, it can't see everything of the whole world. That's partially observable. And with um, function approximation, we can actually work with those kind of environments. Um, and then usually um, stochastic gradient descent uh, is used to adjust these parameters of the function. Um, and in deep learning, we can use backpropagation to get the gradient that we need to descend on. Okay, a few um, additional challenges that we need to uh, struggle with here is uh, compared to um, supervised learning using function approximators like, um, uh, like deep neural networks. In reinforcement learning, we have uh, non-stationarity. So our policy keeps changing and we need to, we don't have a static data set with the distribution always being the same, but it changes with our policy. Then we have a bootstrapping. So estimating estimates based on other estimates and we have delayed targets. So sometimes a reward is only received after a sequence, a long sequence of actions. And we have a non-IID uh, data. So where I am right now is highly correlated with where I will be next. And there are some, some tricks that can be used to fight those problems, like uh, using batches that you can randomize um, and stuff like that. But uh, it's still problems that you will struggle with when you use function approximation in reinforcement learning settings. OK, that was our short excursion. Let's get back to the backward view. So we have this, um, this uh, weight vector, which describes the functions of our value function approximator. And we have, uh, so we can think of it as a long-term weight vector. And then we have a short-term memory vector, the eligibility trace, which uh, remembers uh, the most recent states that we were in, or the most uh, recent activities in the weight vector. And this is usually short, shorter than an episode. Okay. And the idea is that when a component of this uh, weight vector participates in producing an, a value estimate, then the eligibility trace at this weight vector is increased and then starts to fade away with lambda. So W and Z have the same size. So each W element is assigned an eligibility, eligibility trace um, parameter. And when this element in the weight vector participates in producing a value estimate, the eligibility trace that goes with it uh, increases. And then uh, it, maybe in the next step, it doesn't participate anymore. So the eligibility tr trace decreases and decreases and decreases over time until it is active again. And learning happens then when at um, WT a TD error occurs and the eligibility trace is bigger zero. So 
Um, we'll make updates uh, on the weight vector at every step. And um, this eligibility trace idea can be applied to non-episodic problems and um, learning can happen continually and behavior can immediately adapt. And there's even some evidence in, in neuroscience that there might be something like eligibility traces used on the neuronal level. And I think eligibility traces were even inspired by some properties of synapses. Okay, so how does learning work now? So the weight vector is updated proportional to the TD error and the eligibility trace of recently visited states. So um, what does this mean? Uh, the new weight vector is the old vector plus alpha, the step size, um, times the TD error at this time step and times the eligibility trace at this time step. Okay, let's look at this in, in code. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, this one is for estimating V. Of course, this can also be applied to the Q value in the same way. Um, so we input a policy that we want to evaluate and uh, some reinitialize uh, value function arbitrarily. So for example, in the neural network, we would put initial random weights. Um, and then we repeat for every episode or however long we want if it's not episodic. And we initialize the state, first state, and um, we initialize the eligibility trace to be zero everywhere. And then we repeat for every step. We choose an action from our policy for the state. We take this action and we observe the next reward and the next state. And then we update um, the eligibility trace, which is the discount factor times the trace decay parameter lambda times the eligibility trace plus the gradient at the value estimate function of the state under the parameters. Okay, so this is the value function gradient. So uh, the eligibility trace is increased by the value gradient um, and the components of the weight vector that participated in producing the value estimates are updated. So let's see um, how the um, TD error is calculated. This is very similar to what we already know. We take the next reward that we observed um, plus the discounted value estimate. So now we write a little hat because it's an estimate or because it's an approximate function. Um, okay, the uh, approximate value for the next state minus the one for the current state and both under the weight parameters. Okay, and then we update the weight by adding to the old weight um, what we just wrote above, um, step size times the TD error times the eligibility trace. Okay, then we set the current state to the next state and repeat this until our state is terminal and then we start the next episode. Okay, uh, so these eligibility traces can help with non-Markov tasks. Um, because uh, it makes it similar to Monte Carlo methods, which have an advantage because they don't bootstrap. Um, and But uh, TD lambda bootstraps though, but it still um, goes in the direction. Um, and it can deal better with long-term rewards. Uh, yes, Philip? So um, how do we integrate what we've learned above multiple uh, steps until the S terminal is reached? So we store different weights uh, in our example here? Um, so basically, okay, so let me do it like this. So we have, um, let's say we have, a, uh, let's make it not too complicated. Let's say we have a linear function approximator with 
I don't know, a combination of four features. So let's say we have four weights in our weight vector and these weights produce a value estimate. And let's say in step n, um, those two weights produce a value estimate for state s. And then uh, since those two help uh, participate in producing this value estimate, um, now uh, the this eligibility trace here and here goes up. Okay, I'm not sure how I should draw this, but let's do it somehow. Okay, then we have the next state. Let's say those two participate in it. Okay, and um, that means this one increases, this one increases more, and the other one here it decreases because time has passed and it didn't uh, participate. Okay. Um, where's the weight color here? Okay, and now let's say a TD error arrives. And that means, so now we look at these eligibility traces and depending on how active they are, these weights will be updated. So since here there's no eligibility trace active, this weight won't be updated in, our, in this um, update uh, using, uh, according to this TD error. These two will be updated a lot because their eligibility trace is pretty active. This one will be a little bit because this state participated a bit back in the past. So it kind of remembers what uh, happened in the past few steps. Um, and it doesn't uh, just store the past um, feature vectors for all the past states, but it um, remembers it in a sense of these eligi decaying eligibility traces. Does that make sense? Thanks, that was very helpful. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Um, Okay, so it also helps on tasks with many steps per episodes or tasks with no episodes at all. But um, in practice, the traces shouldn't be so long that it turns into Monte Carlo methods because then the performance isn't, in practice, uh, usually isn't that good anymore. Um, and it requires more computation than TD0, but it can enable significantly faster learning. Um, so if data is scarce, eligibility traces are better, but if, if data is just abundant, um, then it's maybe not worth the computational effort, but um, for example, in many real applications, they are really worth using them. <laughs>